CICPA Town Hall, a high-impact news broadcast to help you navigate the most pressing issues facing the profession. Get timely and critical information, real-time interpretation and analysis. Learn strategies, best practices, and capabilities to drive long-term success for your clients and organization. Thursdays at 3 p.m. Eastern Time. Good afternoon and welcome to the AICPA Town Hall Series. I'm Eric Auskerson and we're coming to you live from Engage in Las Vegas with a live audience, so welcome. We've got close to 4,000 people attending Engage and we always have you know, over 7,000 on our weekly or bi-weekly town halls. The theme of Engage is adapt and thrive, and that's what we've been doing uh, with these town halls for the past two years. We've got a great program for you today. We're gonna kick things off with Jill Schlesinger, uh, who's a CBS business analyst and one of the leading speakers on the state of the economy. Then we're gonna talk a little bit about what's happening in DC, go into a top firm issues update, and then we're going to have a great discussion on the future of finance uh, with the new AICPA chair. And we'll close with the open forum. So right now, I'd like to welcome Barry Melanson, the CEO of the AICPA, and Jill Schlesinger. It's great to be with you. Great to be with you as well. Thanks for inviting me. Great to be with you as always, Eric. And uh, thanks for all the energy and pulling all these off. And it's great to have uh, all the attendants. People really are excited about being the energy in the room, really excited about being together face to face and building those uh, relationships. So here's a little bit more about Jill and what we're gonna try to do in the next 15 or 20 minutes, is talk a little about the, about the economy, inflation, supply chain, state of, state of employment, <laughs> and then the chance of a recession. So to kick things off, want to highlight this article from the Wall Street Journal, uh, which discusses a Wall Street Journal, University of Chicago, NORC poll. They've been doing this for decades. And, you know, it, it's quite striking, uh, some of the information from this poll. Some 83% of the respondents describe the state of the economy as poor or not so good. Over 40% feel they cannot improve their standard of living. If you look at this chart, that's the, the, the people that feel that they cannot improve the standard of living is now greater uh, than, than those that feel they can. And then finally, the survey really highlighted the concerns around the high inflation. So you look back at 2021, we had the highest uh, GDP since 1984, and look at where we are now. Yeah, I know, I'm exhausted. I don't know about you guys. Um, so yes, 5.7% GDP in expansion, um, and we had a contraction in the first quarter. We'll expand again in the second quarter. So I don't, I'm not, I don't think that we're going to see a minus sign when the next GDP is released. But it's, it's a weird situation, honestly, because I just keep thinking back to, I go back two years, and you know, you're in the middle of a global pandemic, and it's so frightening. And you look at confidence surveys from then, they actually are better than the uh, confidence surveys today. And if you think about that time, I know I don't like to take you back to the before times, but like it's, it's rough when you think about, we had no idea what was going on. The global economy was shut down. It was like frozen under ice. Nothing was happening. We had the worst contraction. We had um, a, a short but incredibly steep bear market. The S&P 500 lost a third of its value in five weeks. And to think that people feel better now is funny because it just reminds me of recency bias, right? Whatever just happened really informs you. People can't go back two years. They don't want to think about how frightening that was. Um, so we are going to slow down this year. And I think that we are, you know, listen, the Fed is probably late in their um, rate hike campaign. Um, we have to attack 8.3% inflation. And I, I can understand why people are really unnerved because we have an entire generation of people who have never seen inflation ever. And not even just, in, like, they haven't seen inflation CPI over 2%. So this is phenomenal for them. They're freaking out. I don't blame them. 
So, uh, you know, it's, it's a very weird moment because I feel like there's all this talk about recession and it's like the most frequently asked question, is it gonna be and isn't, is it not gonna be? And I keep thinking like, there's gonna be a recession, guys, right? We've, we've had 13 recessions since World War II. It's part of the economic cycle. It's gonna happen. And it's not gonna be a two month recession. It's gonna be a more garden variety recession. Hopefully it won't be as bad as the great recession, but it's gonna happen. And I would say that the state of the economy is really in major transition right now. And it's hard to report what's going to happen in real time. I mean, I'm not an, econ an economist, thank God. But uh, my friends who are mathematicians, accountants, and statisticians, they do like to call economics the soft science. Because <laughs> they said it's not really based in anything, right? It's not a formula. So it's a, it's a guesstimate. And soft landing, shallow recession, real recession, I don't know where it's going to go. But we are in transition. And it's tough to be a business leader right now in that transition. Well, you look at some of the news from today. Uh, Treasury Secretary Yellen testified in front of the Senate. Uh, she stated that the inflation levels were unacceptable. She also provided a forecast that by year end it'd be 4.7%. The market seemed to be absorbing this. In Target came out with some news today that they've got you know, too much inventory, they're cutting prices. Mm. So you said we're in a moment right now, but maybe Maybe this moment and all these headwinds are gonna help give us a soft landing. Yeah, maybe. I mean, it's just really hard to imagine that you have a Federal Reserve that's chasing 40-year highs in inflation. The Fed has not actually been chasing inflation for probably two or three decades. They've not been in this position. They have, in anticipation in higher, of higher prices, have raised rates, but they've never been this late in the game. So yeah, I mean, they're tapping the brakes on and I know they're hoping. I think that it's, it's tough when you start late. Anyone who knows, I, you know, I, I drive on the Long Island Expressway a lot. It's a rough road. And uh, when you hit a pothole, you're like, please God, don't me, let, let me end up in the ditch. And I think that's probably how most of the Fed officials feel. Like, please God, we're tapping. If we go into a pothole, we're skid. Let me not end up in that recession ditch. And I think it's tough. You know, one of the interesting questions on that, Jill, is, it, you know, experience is a really important thing, but it has been so long. Mm. You just wonder in those discussions if there was some paralysis there because of, well, it hasn't been there. Yeah, and I would say this, that, you know, from what I understand from some people who are close to Fed officials, that the Great Recession really scarred a lot of these people. And I want to be clear about that, that they're human beings at the Fed. All the people who work for them are human beings. They're not, uh, you know, there's no magic formula to figure out how to do this. The Great Recession was, um, for them, this seminal moment where they did very well in the crisis, but they did not manage the recovery very well. And there is a real criticism that they probably did not allow the economy to heal enough and may have gotten things started a little bit too quickly in rate hikes. And I think in this, in this iteration, I can see the, the mistake of the past, that you're absolutely right, that like all of a sudden they're like, well, wait a minute, if we start, if we start raising rates right now, are we gonna screw the people who are finally doing and back on their feet again? And I think that really did influence them. Right, and speaking about back on your feet, I, I, I wanna get your thoughts, and you and I had some off-camera discussions on that, but the impact of this to really the lower socioeconomic aspects, mm -hmm. and if you think in a systems way, you know, obviously the economy has a big political impact, but, but where this inflation is occurring and where this tension in, the, in the, the article that Eric pointed out really points to almost a hopelessness, and you talked about even not being able to go back two years, but it sort of hits people in their face. Yes. You know, it's at the pump, mm -hmm. it's at the grocery store, um, and, it, and it's, a, you know, it's, it's a regressive impact in a, in a country where we have sort of been fighting this have and have not environment for a while now, and it's exacerbating that to a large degree. Yeah, I think, I think that's, a great, that's a great point in that, you know, when you think about the quintiles of income and wealth, you know, two separate things, but you guys all understand that. But when you think about the lowest quintile um, and you think the price of gas is up, the price, price of food is up, and the price of shelter is up. There's not a lot left in the budget once that happens. So even if those folks are getting increases, even if you used to work in the leisure and hospitality industry and maybe you made 12 bucks an hour, and now you've jumped into an Amazon warehouse and you're making 18 bucks an hour, 
you got a huge raise and yet you may still feel really worried. And I, and I can understand that. I, I also think what's interesting about when we think, you know, the, these big ticket items and what happens is that the unique nature of the COVID recession was really stark. I don't think any of us quite understood this idea of freezing an economy, people left at home with money piling up because there was stimulus and there was a lot of money that was piling up. The savings rate goes, the personal savings rate goes to 33% in April of 2020. Right. And people have nowhere to spend, so they shift to goods. And then we have this thing that like, Honestly, 85% of the nation never heard of something called supply chain. Exactly. I mean, when I started pitching stories about supply chain, you know, a year and a half ago, people were like, producers, what are you talking about? What is that? I'm like, you know how you get these things from one place to the other? That's the supply chain. Oh, okay, we get that. You know, you can't get this here. So I think the idea that all that money started going into goods, supply chains are screwed up. And then when you really consider just the, just the absolute huge dollars that went out there, it's pretty startling. And even the most liberal economists, I believe, in their heart of hearts thought, oh boy, we're running into a problem with this much money flowing into the economy. And I think it's not really a surprise. To me, what the surprise really was is that as prices were actually going up, that a year ago, even, when, like, even after Larry Summers started ringing the bell and saying we got inflation, as late as last summer, fall, even like kind of moving into the end of the year, we had a Fed that was saying it's temporary. It's it's Peaks. Trans it, Peaks. it's odd to consider that, isn't it? Yeah. Well, Absolutely. we've got we've got some questions coming in. Actually, today there was a few senators that commented about it being transitory. Yeah. So, questions here on where do you, how high will will the Fed hike mm -hmm. go? You know, what do you think of, of this inflation outlook that was just yeah. know, stated today? Um, I think the Fed goes 50 basis points June meeting, 50 basis points in July. Now, they don't have another meeting till September. And we probably, eight and a half is probably the high, per, the eight and a half percent that we saw two months ago is probably the high print, probably. I mean, listen, the war in Ukraine really did kind of derail a lot of this, so uh, in terms of energy um, and also for some food. But if we go... Uh, if we go, well, let's say that we walk into the September meeting and we're percentage point higher. I think that people are underestimating that Jay Powell is unafraid of spooking markets right now, even though he's talking a lot. And from what I understand, the nickname for him around DC is Jesuit Jay, where he is basically gonna say, I'm gonna do what is right and what I believe in. And I am, and you remember who is his, he bows at the altar of Volcker. And he really does believe that rates are going to go a lot higher. So um, we have to get rate. Listen, we are still essentially below neutral right now. So we have to do better than that. So I think that we probably are going to get at least one and a half and maybe up to two percentage points more in Fed funds through, by of, the end of the year. And of course, from our members' perspectives, being advisors to business, small and mm -hmm. large, you know, those interest rate hikes as it relates to budgets and capital expenditures and all of those types of things, are a bit of further dampening as to what goes on from a confidence perspective. I do not envy any of you who are in the mood of doing your planning right now because I think it's really difficult. I really get that. And I hear from people, I have a podcast and a radio show and people call in and they're like, I just don't know what to do. Like, I really need help now, but I'm worried that in the future things are gonna soften up. What should I do? And you know, I do think that in a weird way, these moments do provide great opportunities for business leaders and business owners and managers. You know, we've been talking about this tight, tight, tight labor market and Maybe there is an opportunity here where things soften up a little bit. Maybe you're going to be able to poach people. Not from anyone here. You wouldn't do that to your friends and neighbors here. Someone who is not part of AICPA. <laughs> and, um, and I do think that what is, I guess, Barry and I were talking about this yesterday. I am really wondering, and I wonder how you all think about this, that, you know, how much of these wage increases are going to stick? Just in what areas, like you mentioned Target, we know that Target and Walmart have had some bad numbers in the last um, few weeks and bad headlines. They staff up, Amazon staffs up, Tesla staffs up, everyone staffs up because the demand is massive and then boom, it falls down, right? We go from goods and now we go to services. And I think that there are going to be some real hard decisions in many of these companies that did just, you know, popped in there, right? Well, and that's, Another thing that's been coming out over the past week 
is just CEOs saying they're bracing for a recession. Yeah. Yet, yet Elon Musk talking about what he's doing. He's doing a lot of things. <laughs> so, but this is the CEOs right now, the management, absolutely. Hiring freezes, you know, the frothy big offers, you know, are beginning to kind of be step back. Yeah, I guess I wonder, like, I do think that we are biased because we come from, and you know, I, I, I am, listen, I have my, my life partner works for a huge investment bank, so I'm very familiar with what's going on there. I interview a lot of the CEOs from Wall Street and a lot of business leaders, and I hear the hesitation. On the other hand, what I also hear from them is this little glimmer, like, oh, but you know, if things softened a little bit, it wouldn't be so bad because then I could find the right talent and I can retain my talent. You know, a lot of folks on Wall Street, they had um, their, their entire legal and compliance departments picked over by the crypto is industry. And they are now starting to see that stop a little bit. And I think that when you're a business leader, these moments of crisis or inflection points do provide opportunities. We, we know that the deal making has kind of tamped down. I think that among small and medium sized businesses, there is a moment for the survivors who have the balance sheet to do something. They're going to have some great opportunities. And I think that that's always when people are ready to rock and roll. Yeah. And when you look at it on the human capital side, um, if you take it down into the, the human resource or the people departments of organizations, mm -hmm. they were for the last four or five months, there was a lot of uh, pay equity. I'm not talking about from a diversity perspective, but from an incumbent versus an outside hire perspective. Right. And how do you manage that? And it's happening in CPA firms as well. When you, you know, you're seeking people and what are the implications of that to your existing staff? And then how long, of a, how long do you hold on to that higher paid individual that you in effect might have in today's times overpaid to get into your yes, organization. Yes. What happens in those inflated I think there's numbers? going to be a really interesting reset. You know, we had a great resignation issue. We know that people over 55 were pretty freaked out. I mean, listen, there's no doubt that the, the pandemic freaked out people. But we also know there are certain sectors of the economy that were more greatly affected. We know leisure and hospitality still has 1.3 million fewer jobs than they had before the pandemic. But, you know, professional and business services are, you know, rocking and rolling and moving along. And you know, what I think is going to be interesting also is to really consider, you know, if I am trying to attract and retain the best younger next generation, how do I make room for them? And what is the career path? Because you're right, if I have the person who I hired and paid up for this person, uh, I may have to say, well, sh is she really the one who's going to advance? Should I hire two, should I hire a Barry and an Eric and get rid of Jill because she's too expensive? And I think those are conversations that are happening, for sure. Yeah, I think that's a big management challenge and then with the uncertainty of where interest rates go on top of that, so. Um, well, this discussion, we're gonna continue. We're gonna, we're gonna move into, and Jill's gonna stay with us to talk a little bit about Washington, D.C., but you know, you, Jamie Dimon saying there's a looming economic hurricane. Sometimes those hurricanes go out to sea, sometimes yeah, and you have to, to plan determined. for it, right? And so thank God, you know, you're in an industry where you know how to plan. That's what I would say, that there are certain industries that are going to be caught flat-footed for sure. Well, so people, but people who are clients of firms, and the firms know this very well, or if you're in the finance function, when things start to turn down, the CPA is very much needed. When things start to come up, CPA is very much needed. If you look at how our profession has fared in most of those cyclical points, um, we're, we're usually late effect, early come out. Mm -hmm. And so that's not the worst place to be. No, it's a great job. I wish I could pass that exam. I never would have. <laughs> Very, they were rather busy uh, during the pandemic. Yeah, yeah I know. During no the kidding. economic <laughs> shutdown. So now we have been talking about BBB <laughs> for at least six months, if not longer. So Barry, the, the latest here, somewhat of a, a little bit of a confusing co quote from Senator Manchin. <laughs> yeah, the BBB, we've, we've talked about it on, I don't know, you know, 50 town halls it feels like. Uh, it really is all centered with Senator Manchin. There is a lot of, there are a lot of issues as to whether it's, it's, it's as close to a, as dead as you can be unless Senator Manchin decides to flip a switch and it, it really is revolving around him. 
Um, but there are, there are some rumblings. Not, it's not zero, and I think that's important to understand. Mm. Um, you know, there's some political imperatives. With an election year, the Democrats would like to get something through. There's actually a very limited number of congressional days left. Um, and there's things on the Senate's agenda, you know, Yeah, frankly. but it's a weird thing, right? Like, you're right. I think that there's like, oh, we want to win. But on the other hand, would you not, I would at least think that there are some more fiscally minded lawmakers who get that if you have more spending that is approved, that that just exacerbates the inflationary yeah. environment? Well, and, Senator Manchin, was, that was one okay, of his but, points all but, along. Uh, true, except that he was you know, like saying like, no, 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 before we even had inflation. So I think that you're right. There is always, listen, that if that quote really does say it all because it says nothing. It is like words, it's like jumbled word salad. And because I think that one day he wants to do one thing from the reporting I know from our folks on the Hill that he loves the power that he has, but he has no idea how to harness it and implement it. So I think that, um, I think it is a very, very small likelihood that something does pass, but you're right, it could. And if that were the case, um, the stock market's gonna go completely insane if that happens. Yeah, and the only thing from our profession's perspective, there, there are some tax provisions if you wake up one morning and read that it's moving. Uh, predominantly one that's being still bantied about in there is a, is an, is a, a book income tax for the, you know, the difference between taxable income and financial statement income on the, on the larger companies, mm. which would affect a small portion of our profession, but the larger companies, and also a surtax, a surtax rate over higher income individuals that are clearly still being part of the discussion. Unfortunately, it, Barry's the only one here who that affects. <laughs> yeah, wrong. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, wrong on that. So All right. Barry, just somebody, you know, very, very, very slim, slim chance. Uh, related related to BBB. So that, we haven't even talked about it yet, but the geopolitical events uh, of 2022 clearly have you know added to the overall complexity of the market. Well, you had a you had a, uh, a executive order. President Biden signed an executive order a few weeks ago that basically said no professional services in the space of of advisory and tax compliance and things of that nature could be uh, delivered to anyone associated with with Russia. Um, now, there are some real, it's very specific. It went into effect last night at midnight, and we have been meeting with Treasury to say, you can't honestly mean you don't want companies that have, for instance, Russian shareholders to not file their tax returns and pay taxes to the federal government. That seems like an unintended consequences mm -hmm. that, that you don't want. So there's a compliance notion versus an entrepreneurial notion that should be considered. And our meetings have been very, positive with Treasury on that point. I think they get it. Um, and we act, there were some FAQs that came out yesterday. It didn't address this, but we still think that they will address that point. And I can tell you, it, it does skew to larger businesses, but we've had many, many, many discussions with smaller firms who have clients that touch this particular point. And of course, our position is the compliance part should be exempted from the interpretation of this executive order because people have to comply and pay taxes makes, makes some sense from that standpoint. So stay tuned. And the only thing I would say is that if you have that, or if you haven't had a, you know, you really should have the conversations with your clients. Sometimes there's some connections there that you might not be fully aware mm -hmm. of, but if you have it, and it's really unfortunate, but absent clear information, it, it, it probably does mean you have to get some legal advice as to what you can and cannot do. We're hopeful to take that compliance part where you don't have to get legal advice that it would be clear, but it's not yet done. So we'll see where that goes. Well, we've got a number of questions coming in. So maybe I'm just gonna take a couple of these uh, before we, we, we thank Jill and move to the next segment. One, housing market, you know, mm. comments on the housing market, but let's maybe this one first related to uh, the, the Russian-Ukraine war and energy, you know, how do you see energy playing out in the months ahead. Lot, there's a lot of activities occurring around the world in mm. the U.S. So energy first, maybe gas prices, and then housing market. Yeah, I mean, I don't necessarily think that the energy situation is loosening up anytime soon. I just don't. I mean, this war has m moved now into, you know, past 100 days. Um, it doesn't look like it is ending anytime soon. I don't know what you guys think. Um, 
the Russian connection to Europe is, you know, pretty significant. And um, the Europeans, while they want to remain energy independent, they they are not. They hope to move to that. And uh, the announcements by the European Union, you know, we hope to do this, we do this, but we're going to exclude the pipeline stuff, which is where we get most of our oil. I mean, I don't really see there being, uh, I don't see us going from, you know, 110 or 20 per barrel back to $85 a barrel anytime soon. So I guess um, after speaking to um, the inspector gadget of the CPA world, it means we should all buy electrical vehicles. So I'm going to maybe there put that in my mind. Um, I think the housing market is really interesting. You know, I, I, I'm really amazed at how many people just pushed forward their desire to buy a home during the pandemic. I think a lot of people had written off a lot of millennials and said they're not going to be homeowners. They don't want homes. Yes, they do. They started a little bit later and they paid off their student loan debts and they're, they're, they got jobs and things worked out and the housing market is great. I think that probably activity is already moderating. It's moderated for a few months. Um, remember when you get these Case-Shiller numbers, they're three months behind. Uh, prices probably are going to remain high, but we're not going to have 20% increases year over year. We're going to go back down to single digits. And, you know, just like it has been for pretty much like about 100 years that the housing market over the long term matches the inflation rate, and that's what's going to happen. Um, I do think that there is some serious sticker shock among people who are trying to buy a, if you're an average American median household income of say $60,000 and you're trying to buy a $350,000 house and your mortgage rate just popped to 5%, you're not buying the house. It's done. So um, there is a, a lot of talk about how things are going to slow down. Don't forget that a ton of people have so much equity in their homes that they, the activity is going to remain robust, robust enough. You know, the people who just said, I had nowhere to move, so I didn't, I, there was no house. Inventory is rebuilding and replenish. And I think that the housing market activity is going to start looking a lot normal. I don't think there's going to be a housing crash. I think there are markets where prices could go down because they went up so fast, but I don't see a national housing crisis because we just don't have the same kind of debt that's outstanding. So it might settle down a little bit like the employment market. With, yeah, with I think it's all settling yeah. down and, and, and I'd like to get to some sort of equilibrium that usually lasts about five minutes. <laughs> okay. With that, would like to say goodbye to you and thank you for all you've done here uh, at Engage. You're going to continue to be our moderator tomorrow and, and through the end. So and hopefully we can have you in our New York studio. Yes, I love that New York studio. It's very fancy, so I <laughs> did, loved it. So thank you guys so much. And I think it's a really important component, um, like a really nice thing that came out of COVID that you got to be able to do these and really bring people in. And um, so I appreciate it. And I appreciate all of you folks showing up here live and cutting your lunch a little short. Thank you, Thanks. Jill. Welcome, Lisa. Hey there. Okay. So now let's move into some Senate Finance Committee items, Barry. Yeah, so uh, obviously one of the big things that's on a lot of people's minds is still ERC. Um, ERC being um, an issue that um, is about people who are sort of posturing very aggressive positions on the uh, employee retention credit your clients hearing that, saying, why can't you do that? And then, of course, it creates different tax, amended tax return ramifications to that. Uh, I can tell you, and, and I know, Lisa, you've, we've produced some guidance to help firms with that or help firms with their clients. Our team in Washington just this week has been meeting with some very high-ranking uh, members in, this, in the Senate, explaining the nuances of this and why you know, they should be concerned about that. And I think we will start to see some questions being asked and some, and some um, sort of some pushing in the IRS's way, but some comments? Yeah, um, our, our team has been working on educating and informing some of the, the Senate staffers around those aggressive marketing tactics that they've been taking and the aggressive positions that they've been taking. So um, April Walker has just released a, a great podcast with Chris Wittich, it's in the continuing um, a tax odyssey series, and it's going to go into a lot of great insights around how to help your clients um, with some of these aggressive marketing approaches that are being thrown at them, 
it goes into some of the details around how to qualify because a lot of it's around supply chain disruption. There's confusion around supply chain disruption, closures, how to document closures, um, how to charge for ERC work with your clients. Um, so a, a great podcast that I'll point you to. If you're not signed up for the, uh, the series, the Tax Odyssey series, I'd highly recommend it. April does a great job in getting insights to you from other practitioners who are really diving deep into some of these topics. Um, to, to the point about the, the Senate in, uh, looking at some of these issues, the, what the legislative team told me is stay tuned. Yeah, so. it's in process, but the awareness is definitely rising in Washington, just like the lingering awareness over the destruction of 30 million documents and the pressures that that brings into the system. A um, lot of questions, a lot of hearings that have been going on uh, related to all of the IRS service issues, which remains a top priority for us. And, you know, unfortunately, there are not, you know, simple or immediate answers to this question. The IRS continues to you know, talk about the need for additional funding and long-term technology solutions, which we agree with. But as we point out, and you've heard me say, you can do all that you want. It's not going to solve the problems of the backlog and the services that exist right now. And so uh, it, there really is a lot of, of work to still be done at the IRS level to make this better. As we're you know, still in this tax season, you can still see problems building for next tax season if we don't find ways to address that. And we do lead a coalition that's trying to get some, you know, tax preparer entry points into the IRS so that you can deal with client issues more efficiently. We'd like to see that be able to be done electronically. We'll see, but at least some pathway mm -hmm. to getting different service levels that would, would help you with your clients. And as I say, it helps, it helps preparers, it helps the IRS, and all, but maybe most importantly, it helps taxpayers, and that's a really important part. Well, and I think what we're going to see, we are going to see more ERC suppliers, you know, solutions come to market. We're, we're seeing it here at Engage, so there's going to be a lot of growth here. It's going to be something that we're watching, and we'll be thinking about that. There'll be times where firms are going to partner with some of these ERTC suppliers. There's going to be times that uh, you're, you're going to say that's probably not the best move for your client to, to leverage them. So with that, let's uh, move into technical updates and talk about the top issues survey. So ERC and the IRS conversation was a perfect lead in to the results of the 2022 PCPS CPA firm top issues survey. Thank you to those of you who participated in the survey. We had about 750 responses from firms of all sizes, but 60% of the responses were from firms with five or fewer professionals. So let me give you a little bit of insight into the eye chart that we created for you. And basically the way we've laid this out is there are, a th there are themes of the issues across all firm sizes. And you'll see that the first one is challenges when working with the IRS. So we asked firms, what are the issues that are impacting your firm right now from a practice management st standpoint? And then we segregate those by firm sizes across the board, challenges working with the IRS was, was a, one of their top issues. Um, I've kind of color-coded them for you just to get, make it a little bit easier. So if you look at the, the green tax, those are all going to be related to tax issues. So challenges when working with the IRS, keeping up with the changes and complexity of tax laws, seasonality, layering of deadlines. Um, we've got keeping up with COVID relief programs in there as well. It's still impacting some of the smaller firms. So when I look at this, I see the role that the profession played in the last two years during the pandemic is showing up right here because that created stress on firms as they took on the position, as, as you like to call it, very first responders to the economic situations that their clients were facing. So IRS issues and then the staffing issues, which we've put in blue text for you, finding staff, developing staff, retaining staff, their compensation and rewards programs, and then how to keep that connectivity and morale in a hybrid or um, remote environment. So you've got IRS issues and people issues. And, and a lot of still the employee side of wanting to work remotely and the challenges of 
managing that and, and you know, what's the right mix is a big issue on, on leaders' minds as well. Yeah, and I don't think anyone has the secret sauce, so spoiler alert. But, you know, we do know that flexibility and, and not sticking into one concrete position is, is going to help with those conversations. Um, you know, so there's a lot going on on this one, but then if we look at what are the issues that they think will impact them over the next five years, you'll again see a lot of commonalities. So changes in the regulatory environment, we know that issues like um, ESG disclosures or PCAOB rules or changing um, DOL requirements, changing tax laws are all going to be top of mind for firms as they think about what the next five years looks like. But also changing um, the, the ability to change, uh, to adapt to changing client needs, excuse me, is top of mind as well as all of these great emerging technologies that we've been talking about here at the Engage conference. So data analytics, blockchain, AI, how can you use those within your firm to help with changing client expectations, but also with staffing needs, which we see popping up as a, a firm top issue as well. Jill talks about, Jill talked about the, uh, you know, people didn't know what supply chain meant. We talk a lot about business models, and, and the clients of firms or the employer of CPAs in business and industry, uh, you know, those business models are under such stress and such rapid evolution and change, technology and environment, et cetera, that uh, that permeates back into CPA firms. And we've been talking about, you know, looking at the business model of firms, the billing practices of firms, the approach. Obviously, the staffing and technology comes into that. But you know, that, when you look at that five-year period of time, that's really the stress factor of how do you, you know, succession came up there. Maybe how you create succession, but succession of a business model and approach inside firms is clearly front and center today as well. And Barry and Lisa, when I look at this, I all expect over the issues over the next five years, I see a lot of opportunity. We had Coach K kick off the conference yesterday, and he talked about change, and he said one of the key things is making the change good and positive. And each one of these items, technology playing a huge role in transform, transforming the practice of accounting, changing client needs, lots of opportunities there with, with the changing client needs. The regulatory environment, it is, it is what the profession you know, helps uh, interpret uh, for their clients. So there's a lot of opportunity here uh, in the road ahead. And you, when you're here at Engage, you're on these town halls, you, you can feel the energy. We're, we're, we're solving a lot of these issues together. And I, I think the big takeaway in all of that is that unfairly people say to about the profession that we are not adaptive. We are incredibly adaptive to change as a profession. I do hear from leaders of firms, and I interact with a lot of them, who say, you know, I have, I have partners or I have staff who just want to keep doing what they've been doing and how they've been doing it. But the reality is, if you look at the profession today, or two years ago, or five years ago, or eight years ago, it wasn't anything like the profession was 10 years before whatever period of time that you picked. And so it's, it, it's, it's not any different than leaders of firms had. The pace of it is probably greater, but the need is, is, is there. And five years from now and 10 years from now, we aren't going to recognize a practice compared to where it is today. I mean, and with that, is opportunity, and some people will be earlier adopters of that, some people will be slower to change, but the skill set inside, if even small firms of managing that change, you know, yeah. motivating that change, making those decisions related to it is a really key component. It's a lot, lot of optimism. So with that, Lisa? I was just gonna say, I think the opportunity is, is the right word. I think back to, you know, some of these technologies can sound a little scary and a little overwhelming until you actually put them in practice. But I equate it to, you know, way back in the dark ages when I took my 13 column green paper out to do an audit. You're too young for that. I, I did, I promise, <laughs> I promise. And so now Excel is ubiquitous. I can't go a day without Excel or Word or, or email, things that didn't exist back in, in my day. So think about how much better an audit is now that you're not manually footing a trial balance. There's opportunity to, to really do great things with the profession. Absolutely. So with that, let's bring up our new chair. 
our recently installed chair, AICPA chair, and new Meta. So um, let me introduce to all of you and all of our uh, participants online to Anoop Mehta, who is uh, just about three weeks ago became uh, the chair of the AICPA for a one-year term. And um, Anoop uh, joins, he's from the, from the great state of Maryland. Um, yes. And, and the, the thing is, is that Anoop has spent most of his career literally working with rocket scientists. I like to tease him about that <laughs> because he has been the CEO and uh, now a COO of a, a um, a company or companies, I should say, that really service NASA. Uh, Anu, share a little bit about your background. I think it's a fascinating story to how you became a CPA and as well, obviously, to the position that you're in now. Well, thank, thank you, Barry. Um, I, I have to say, the last two years, I've been in the audience or watching the town halls and now I'm sitting here, I can tell you the view is very different. <laughs> okay, and, and I want to keep the audience, uh, let them know that this is my first time up here, and these guys are pros, so, so just keep that in mind. Um, but seriously, um, by the way, you guys in person look awesome, so that's great. Um, so, yeah, Barry, so, uh, you know, when I, um, I spent actually all my life in, in, in private sector, um, I started with a company uh, as an intern while I was still in school, and uh, um, after I graduated, they, uh, the company had grown a little bit, so you know I was able to um, stay there uh, full time, and then grew to finance manager, to a VP of finance, uh, to CFO, and then uh, about six years ago, in 2015, became president and CEO. So you know I've spent my entire career life with. One, one organization. And so, yeah, um, I work with rocket scientists uh, in the uh, area of, uh, you know, earth sciences, space sciences. So when we talk about the ESG, the E part is very, very close to me, very near and dear to me, uh, protecting our, our, our planet. Uh, so, uh, you know, it's been, it's been a phenomenal journey. And I, I know when uh, people talk to me, I said, you know, you're like no other accountant that we've ever met. Uh, and you've never spent life in, you know, in public practice. You've always been in private industry. I said, exactly. But I get to work with some f phenomenal, phenomenal people in this industry. So very, very fortunate to be here. Well, An Anoop, I didn't ask you this question beforehand, but I'm sure all of our listeners and people here would love for you to disclose one of those top secret things that uh, goes on in the space sciences that we don't know about. Well, I told you before I would have to kill you then. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I do want to speak, though, with you a little bit about the, uh, you know, we, we talk about and use the term firms, but, you know, we have 140,000 plus members who work in corporate America and obviously with the CGMA and on a global basis, hundreds of thousands more, and uh, working in corporations. And in this, all of the changes that are happening from a public practice perspective are happening for our members in practice, their clients' offices on the finance side as well. And you sort of see it as a buyer of those services and also as, a, as an employer of those services. So what's your perspective of that whole change environment in the finance space? I think finance is changing. Um, and let's let's take a look at ESG, right? I mean, the space that uh, we're in a finance function in, in the corporation, we're not just looking at short term. We're looking at long term sustainability. We're looking at how do we add value for the future, right? And uh, so, you know, ESG space is huge. Uh, take technology in a finance function infusing technology into everything that we do internally. How do we close our books quicker? How do we automate things? Um, you know, we, we deal with so much data. We have so much data. How do we slice and dice that data so it's relevant? Mm -hmm. And we're only looking at relevant data. So it, it's, it's changing the way we look at things. And the technology implications and even entrepreneurial small businesses um, the, the ties into the CAS 2.0 of the technology supporting the, the human capital perspective. I know you're seeing that as well with even a lot of small businesses turning to those CAS type solutions as a way for them to evolve and to really step up and, and, and afford even some of the things that are going on. Right. In, in our own um, space, uh, government contracting is the space that I work in. 
Um, there are a lot of firms that are, you know, small organizations that can't afford to have full-time controllers, full-time uh, CFOs. So they're looking for their accounting firms to provide that kind of information. So there's a huge opportunity for us. I know Lisa wants to dialogue with you on, on human capital, but just one thing since you referenced ESG, those of you who are regulars, you've, you've heard me talk about a new international standards board that is coming. We'll spend more time in the, at Engage tomorrow on that in our remarks tomorrow, but um, the, the US SASB and integrated reporting are being merged into uh, the IFRS Foundation really at the end of this month, that's all set. Um, and the, the new board is in place. There's gonna be some announcements in the next couple of days on new members of the board. It's gonna have a presence. It's a global board, but it's gonna have a presence in the US. We have a, a, a proposal from the SEC that 500 plus pages, it may or may not get ad adopted. It may change and then get adopted. But the reality is, is the market really around the world is driving this sort of broader footprint of business information. And the, you know, the role of the profession, there's huge opportunity. You like to use the opportunity in that space. And um, ultimately, assurance will play there. But until then, it's about the controls and the information flow that gives that information life. Uh, and so it, it is something to watch. And I always say this because I know people have their opinions about ESG and you're entitled to your opinions, but it, it is about watching this from a profession perspective and where the, the business information set is really evolving. And if we would have been alive 100 years ago when accounting standards were evolving after a market crash in 1929, we would have, you know, some of the same debates would have been happening. Is it, is it right to have a single set of answers and things of that nature? Well, of course it was right, and it's gonna be right in this space, and it's gonna, you know, people who are gonna follow a lot of us in this room are gonna be a lot of activity in this space going forward. And just bear a, a quick comment on that. You know we had, we had, the, we had an ESG symposium in our New York office uh, about a week ago. We brought leading firms, uh, leading members from business and industry, solution providers, the standard setters. I mean, it, there is a lot coming together. A lot of the firms, firms of all sizes, talking about how they're thinking uh, about building out a practice here. We're gonna be putting the capabilities in place like we've done on client accounting services, saying, okay, this is how uh, you can go about supporting your clients, leveraging an ESG solution. And, and really unpacking this. So this is something that will be a journey, but we're gonna go about it with the ecosystem. Well, going back to Barry, what you were saying about uh, it doesn't matter which side of the political uh, area you were in, but I can tell you uh, the information is being demanded by market. It's being dem demanded by consumer. And, and you know, I tell the story. Employees. And employees. employees. Uh, I told a story where, you know, my kids, and I know Sue has mentioned that, uh, my kids will shop at certain places because they have certain, uh, you know, they buy from gro uh, local groceries, they, they uh, pr uh, you know, organic uh, produce that they pr uh, provide. So it's important to them. So it's, this is all market driven. Yes. Yeah. It's, it's more political in this country than any place else in the yes, world, too. Absolutely. Yeah, the thing to be at bear in mind. Lisa, agree. you wanted to. Well, I wanted to talk about people issues because we just talked about the CPA firm top issues, and obviously people were um, front and center there, but the issues are, are very similar even in the, the non public accounting, so in the management accounting space. Absolutely. You know, people should be the center of our focus. I mean, that is so, so important to me, um, especially um, this year as I took, you know, two, uh, two weeks ago as I uh, gave my inaugural speech, I talked a lot about people, why they should be at the center of our focus. Um, you know, everything we do should be centered about their well-being, how we look at them, you know, mental health, certainly last two years, look at all the things that uh, have gone on. Uh, so, um, absolutely, we should be looking at everything that is related to the people. Not only, uh, I'm, I'm going to step stick with mental health just for a minute. Um, in the town hall newsletter that comes out after this, we'll, we'll point you to some of the, the mental health resources that the AICPA and, and PCPS have been putting together because it is such an important topic um, and it's been highlighted by the stress of the pandemic. But leadership development is something that you're... you're uh, 
really uh, passionate about. Absolutely, and if I uh, revert back to the company, um, we started to truly look at leadership development about five years ago. Um, as soon as I took over as president and CEO, I can tell you that had the largest impact on the growth of the organization. So absolutely, development, training, it is very, very critical. And whether, again, whether you're in public accounting or, or management exactly. accounting, people want to work in a, in a place where they know they're being invested in right. and, and being given the opportunity to grow. A couple of other really important topics to, to touch is diversity, equity, and inclusion. Right. And then we'll, we'll close out with a, a conversation about your views on, on remote work and hybrid. and, and uh, Well, I, I tell you, DEI is another important topic for me. Um, you know, uh, you know I, as I've been going around uh, various states visiting people, I've been talking about the, the five keys to, to uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, first is the business case. There is a business case for it. If you look at firms that embraced DEI and i um, and the goals, um, outperformed their competitors. Studies have shown that. We need to be providing support um, and flexibility to women in our workforce, um, certainly address biases um, and, and putting in trainings to address that. Uh, and I, I'll tell you, nothing is more important than being accountable. Whatever goals you set, we need to be accountable. And I would really encourage everybody to go talk to high school students and, and really support the diverse students and, and, and go to HBCUs, go to uh, minority serving institute. This is what the DEI case is all about. Barry, I know you spoke a, a lot recently about all of the different resources that we're putting together and the, and the key stakeholders around the pipeline, but high school students get increasing that awareness as early as we can is, is critical to the, that success. Well, elsewhere at this Engage conference, I spoke to a group of high school teachers uh, this morning that um, are part of a training process. We've trained over the last several years working with state societies about 1,500 high school teachers to teach um, an honors course in accounting that we have to work, and the state societies are doing a great job of working through the system in each individual state for acceptance by a, you know, a, a school district and then ultimately the universities. Um, and it's, it's not the traditional approach to advanced placement, which is a more complicated and uh, difficult process to get through, but this is an honors course that tries to paint the picture. Um, and it's important in all, it, it is important for that to be present in, you know, um, suburban as well as urban high schools that have different makeups and, and all of those types of things. On the remote work, by the way, those, those uh, men and women in the space station, they sort of the epitome of remote work, right? <laughs> I would agree with you. <laughs> that's, well, ex that's extreme. Can we not, can we not say yeah. that? But you know what? I will tell you, though, it's a, such an important topic. Um, and, you know, we got 150, 200 folks here. And if you ask every one of them, I think you would get a different answer. Uh, for me, I will tell you personally, um, I'm a people person. Um, I like interaction mm -hmm. with customers, with employees, and he, I like that face-to-face, -face, and I think that builds trust for me, um, as well as uh, the customers and employees. I could probably work maybe a day remotely, you know, responding to emails and whatnot, but I don't think I could do that five days a week. Now, there are firms and there are companies that are doing it five days a week, which is great, but I think it has to be individual decision. Yeah, it's not one size does not fit all. Oh, right. You've got, you know, the banks in New York, something like Goldman Sachs, 100% in the office, and then you've got technology companies, I think like Twitter, you know, it can be, it can be all remote, so. And then you've got and, public accounting firms who are you got, fully <laughs> remote. Yeah. We, well, we, and we've got fully virtual firms with us here today, and we've got firms that are, that are back in the office. And we had fully virtual firms before COVID. That's right. That's right. We were well prepared. <laughs> and, and you had Elon Musk, Musk just come and said that, we require you to be in the office or at the plant 40 hours a week. Yeah, so all these things are evolving. One thing, uh, Anoop, I know I've, I've spoken to you about is just digital transformation. We, we talk uh, to the firms a lot about it, but we're talking to business and industry. You already mentioned, talked a little bit about it, but you know, the impact of the cloud, you know, automating the close, thinking about security, maybe a, a couple of additional well, comments. Well, I mean, I, I've always looked at uh, 
technology and finance, they're kind of intertwined, right? I mean, it, it, it's the way it's been. Um, so now, you know, we're looking at technology. How do we do our uh, month end closing faster? You know, how do we do that faster? How do, I talked about the data. There is so much data. Mm -hmm. How do we use AI to um, um, extract the right information, the relevant information? So absolutely, this is something, like I said, finance and technology has been intertwined, intertwined and uh, that will lead, you know, that will continue to happen. Well, Lisa, any more questions? We've got, we've got the open forum now. We've got questions coming in, but any more questions for a new peer? Well, let me just talk really quickly about um, the top issue surveys results and what we'll do with them from here. Our teams are, are actively working on synthesizing through the different um, data points, and then we'll start mapping them out to the resources that either already exist or that we need to be developing to help firms and our, our friends in management accounting tackle some of those top challenges. So we'll dig into more of that in, in coming town halls, but we wanted to get you those preliminary um, results out there. Great. Well, Barry, a question here just on Engage. Some of your you know, biggest takeaways being back with, with a few thousand people. Well, I think the energy is fantastic. I think the, I think the profession is is uh, you know a people profession really, and and that plays out. And I I think what you hear is that people are renewing those types of relationships and that the, those frames of references that are so important. I look at it in the remote work and in the, what you feel at this conference is that it's sort of like a relationships are sort of like a bank deposit. You know, there's a there's a balance there. And sometimes you take out from it and sometimes you put into it. And I think, you know, over the last two and a half years, most of us were pulling, making withdrawals out of that relationship bank account. You know, we were dealing with people we knew, we were dealing with relationships that we had. But I think what I, if you take a longer run, a two or three year period of time, I think that you'll see that leaders and firms, people that are, are really in that trusted advisor role are gonna be building those relationships back with the face-to-face -face as much as possible so that they renew that sort of proverbial bank account in, in relationships. And Lisa? Well, it's been interesting as I've been talking to firms over the past few weeks, there's still clients that aren't ready for um, the auditors to come back out into the field. So there's, again, a balance of in-person versus hybrid and how much can you get done virtually, not sitting in a closet in the, in the client's uh, janitor supply room, which is where I got stuck a few times. So just trying to navigate this new experience, leveraging the technology for efficiency, but adding in that human side of the, the relationship. It's a relationship business. Well, thanks, Anu, for being with us. We definitely look forward to having you back at a, another town hall during your, your chairmanship. Thank you very much, sir. Enjoyed it. Thank you, Anu. So with that, we'll go to our closing slides. Here's some of the highlights from today's uh, town hall. There's a question that came in about, are these town halls recorded? Absolutely. We've got the archive right here. Please leverage them, share them with others in your firm. You can share them with your clients. We've got a webinar uh, coming up on, on the 15th uh, related to really doing some of the things that Anoop talked about, you know, understanding how to you know, build more data insights. This is gonna be leveraging uh, some advisory elements of non-financial data insights. The next town hall will be June 23rd, and the one following that is July 7th. We put out a newsletter uh, the start of the following week with highlights. Once again, we've got hundreds of questions. We digest all of these. It's wonderful connecting uh, with the town hall community in these sessions, so thank you. It's great being here at Engage. Thank you very much for today. We look forward to being with you again sometime soon. Thank you for your participation. You can now subscribe to the AICPA Town Hall series on your favorite podcast platform, as well as watch archives on YouTube and AICPA TV. Tune in for live broadcasts Thursdays at 3 p.m. Eastern Time.